and welcome to Heilman and Haver, the stage and screen podcast, coming to you from Casa de Quinn and 1111 Studios in beautiful Port Orchard, Washington. I'm Greg Heilman. And I'm Matt Haver. We're two local actors looking to hone our craft by exploring the best in local theater and on the big screen. Each week we bring you entertainment news and views, celebrate classic Hollywood, enjoy cocktails with a Tinseltown twist, interview talented local actors and directors, and chat with industry experts from L.A. to the U.K. Welcome to the Big 6-0, episode 60. Today is Friday, April 15th, and we are pleased to be joined by a writer, film historian, and all-around movie know-it-all, Sloane DeForest. Sloane is here to talk to us about one of her favorite topics, directors. Her latest collaboration with TCM is called The Essential Director, The Art and Impact of Cinema's Most Influential Filmmakers, and is available now from Running Press. I haven't been able to put the book down. It's uh, not only well-researched and uh, entertaining, but it, it's, it's really a look at the history of cinema over the last century, all the way back to the days of silent film through these stories of individual directors and their careers. So you uh, theater lovers will find plenty of names you'll recognize too, I'm sure. And you can find links to pick up a copy of Sloan's book on our website. And while you're there, to make sure to check out all of the latest stage and screen reviews, arts around the sound news, and past episodes. And we'd love to hear from you. So drop us an email or message on Facebook and Instagram and tell us who your favorite stage and screen directors are. Something tells me many of our favorites are on Sloan's list. Sloan DeForest is a writer, film historian, and like we just said, a all-around movie know-it-all. And as a relative of talking pictures inventor, Lee DeForest, she has film history in her blood. She's authored three books in the Turner Classic Movies Library, the one we just mentioned, The Essential Directors, Dynamic Dames in 2019, and Must See Sci-Fi in 2018. She's also a contributing author of Natalie Wood, Reflections on a Legendary Life by Manoa Bowman, and Grace Kelly, Hollywood Dream Girl by Jay Jorgensen, an editor of the upcoming Psycho 60. She has written about film for Sony, Time Warner Cable, Bright Lights Film Journal, The Film Magazine, and many other publications. Her talking head has appeared on CNN's 2019 series The Movies, as well as the 2022 series Hollywood Icons. Sloan has also made guest appearances on Turner Classic Movies and several podcasts, including ours now, and served as a consultant on the 2020 HBO Amblin documentary Natalie Wood, What Remains Behind. She sometimes writes under a nom de plume, occasionally acts, and has been known to lecture film students on the wily ways of film noir dames. A native Texan, she now lives in Hollywood. Welcome to the show, Sloan. Good to have you here. Welcome. Thanks, guys. It's great to be here. So, Sloan, your classic film pedigree is impeccable, and you've written extensively on on many topics. Why a book about directors? Why now? And uh, what was the process like assembling uh, this list? Well, the first part of that question is easy to answer. Turner Classic Movies had always wanted to do a book about classic directors and they asked me to do it so uh, it was the right time the right place and I had always wanted to do a book like that as well so I jumped at the chance and I'm glad we did it then we actually signed the contract to do the book I think it was late December of 2019 Hmm. and yeah I know right (laughs) it was the rest is history (laughs) before the apocalypse it was the apocalyptic time and just barely. And so the reason I bring that up is things changed a lot, have changed a lot over the past couple of years. And I'm glad that we kind of got it in under the wire, this tribute to to classic directors. I feel like the classics are taking a bit of a hit lately. So um, yeah, it it was really great. I'm glad we did it. And the second part of your question, assembling the list, that was monumental, as you might imagine. Uh, Initially, I wanted to uh, and TCM agreed we wanted to include foreign directors and, and maybe more obscure directors be a little bit, bit more open and diverse and not just a usual rundown of the usual suspects, you know, the Hitchcocks and, you know, the, the, the Kubricks and all the greats. But um, a book like this has limits and there's a page limit set by the, by the publisher and, <laughs> you know, there's just no room for everyone. So that was the problem I encountered and, and it was... Um, quite a chore to taper it down and who do we cut and who do we keep and it was like pulling teeth but I'm happy with what we ended up with I feel like we squeezed a lot of great directors into one compact easy to carry book well it's an interesting way of of presenting the history of filmmaking through this list of of directors I mean you cover silent films through the golden era new Hollywood the auteurs and on the present day um, one of our favorites, the recently passed Peter Bogdanovich, is, is mentioned a couple of times in your book. And the first piece in your book was written by him, a, a director's take. 
And in it, he states that movies are affected by the time in which they're made and the time in which they're seen. And in that context, can you give us an example of a film uh, that was perhaps out of place, ahead of its time, or remains especially relevant no matter when it's viewed? I wish I could just give you one. I wish I had an answer. <laughs> Good answer. Was like, yes, this movie. But, you know, there are so many that spring to mind. I mean, Bogdanovich made some films himself that I think you know, like Paper Moon and The Last Picture Show, even though they're in black and white and they're set in the past, even, you know, bef years before they were made, of course, those could be made today. I think there's elements in them that are very fresh and relevant. And, and um, also, you know, I was thinking, uh, often people would say Orson Welles and Citizen Kane was ahead of its time. And it was in many ways, of course. I'm not disputing that. But, you know, I tend to go... I tend to follow my heart with the cinema and um, and I feel like the films that have the humanity that really that really touch something in the human soul that is eternal. I think those are the movies that like I'm, what's coming to mind are like Sidney Lumet's 12 Angry Men that could be made today. You know, It's a Wonderful Life to me is uh, is eternal and to a lot of people. I'm not the only one, uh, you know, and then there's there's a film that a lot of people haven't seen. I hadn't seen it until I was researching the book. And that's one from 1916 called Shoes by Lois Weber. Again, it's, of course, the technique is much more primitive. You know, you can't look at the film and say, oh, it looks like something that would be released in the multiplex today. But the story could. It's really about a girl, a young woman who works in a store and she she makes so little she's paid so inadequately that she can't afford new shoes and it's just heartbreaking you know and uh you know that speaks to of course women have come a long way i'm not saying we're still there but that speaks to wage inequality and the conditions of you know also lois weber made films about middle class poverty that's hidden because people are trying to keep up appearances and you know i think a lot of people were pushed into poverty with the pandemic and we're still struggling with these issues today and yeah, those are some films that spring to mind for me. So it sounds like it comes down to more of the, you know, well, there's the storytelling aspect, but how a director takes a story that's got a lot of heart and a lot of depth and that human element and is able to take that and present it in such a way that it's relatable. Yeah, exactly. But also, you know, then there's also Kubrick with 2001. I mean, talk about ahead of your time. You know, we could go there. I mean, that's, wow. It's like people are still catching up to that movie. Uh, inner forward uh, University of Chicago professor Jacqueline Stewart, among many other things, Professor Jacqueline Stewart des describes a director's job as, or a director as the person behind the scenes pulling all the elements together. Uh, now, you say that the director's main job is not just to call action, but to make us believe or make the audience forget, really, that there's a director at all. Now, I'd like to know how you have seen directors' jobs change or their role change over the decades. And and maybe a couple uh, examples of, of the directors who wanted to remain kind of anonymous and then others that definitely put their stamp on the films that they were making. Yeah, that's a really interesting question because that struck me when I was, when I was writing and researching the book is how, you know, in the earliest days of film with someone like D.W. Griffith, a director was a cattle wrangler, essentially. Right. You, you, you know, <laughs> It was someone who, uh, and I say I said it instead of he, because there were women directors in the early days of Hollywood. He or she was someone who uh, was like wrangling all the actors and extras and just getting them in the shot and kind of like telling the camera when, when, cameraman when to start. You know, it's hard for us to even imagine that today because uh, gradually, you know, more creative control crept into the job, more power and prestige. It was a gradual process. And then until, you know, the explosion in the 1970s of the, of the creative auteur who really put their stamp on the pictures. Not that I'm saying that there weren't auteurs before the 70s who put stamps on their pictures. Obviously, Hitchcock springs to mind uh, and others. But that's how the director kind of evolved in the studio era up to the 70s. And then I feel like we're kind of regressing again in the 21st century. And we're, you know, this is just my opinion. But I think it's pretty obvious that in some cases today, a director is little more than a CGI wrangler. 
you know, they really are there to make sure the CGI and all the effects come together. And I don't know how much personality they put into the picture. If it, we're talking like a big, you know, a big mainstream kind of special effects extravaganza, which movies are, are leaning more and more toward. But maybe I'm digressing from your question about um, the difference between putting a stamp on a film and being invisible. That's another thing that's really interesting to me because there's kind of two schools of thought, you know, on what makes what a director's job is. I mean, I'm the one that said, you know, it's kind of to remain invisible. But then there were people who would say, no, a director's job, if he's worth his salt, he or she worth their salt is to put their personality, make a personal film and that, that expresses their personality like a Scorsese or something. You know, I just think there's room for both. You know, a good example, I mean, Robert Wise comes to mind. And George Cukor is one of my favorites who doesn't really have the, the personal signature of an auteur maybe. But, um, you know, it's funny, the more I watch these directors' films, the more I thought, well, they're really not, I can see a style. You know, I can see a consistency with Robert Wise or George Cukor, actually. It's just more subtle. I mean, Michael Curtiz, I noticed when I was watching his films, they all, almost all of them have at least one scene that's done in silhouette. It's kind of a personal signature. Um, so it's, it's a little more subtle in, in some directors. But I think all directors put some of their own personality into the work. Well, when we talk about what the role of the, of the director is, even versus the producer, what is the director's role in putting together the heads of the, the, the crew? So you've got the you know, production designer and you've got the composer and all these pieces that are responsible for bringing the director's vision to life. Is the director usually involved in bringing these pieces into a film? Well, it varies is what I found. It varies between decades and, and between mediums. If you're talking television, if you're talking feature film, independent film, obviously an independent film is going to be more guided by, by the director, um, especially if they wrote it as well. Uh, but I think in all cases, I'm of the belief system that film is a director's medium. You know, even if uh, the producer is in charge of a lot of these, um, putting these moving pieces together. The director is the one who has the final, should ideally have the final say about, I mean, yes, it's a collaborative medium because you have the camera operator who does a lot, the cinematographer. The, the screenwriter, of course, contributes the whole story. We have the actors, I mean, you know, on and on and on to costume, wardrobe, everything. These people, they count, you know, they matter. Their, their artistic uh, contribution is in the film as well. But the director is the one who says, yes, I want the green dress, not the blue dress. The director is the one who says, yes, I like your suggestion of this way uh, to frame this shot and we're gonna do it that way. You know, it's just all these decisions add up to making what the, what the final film is. Yeah, it's interesting because I watched, and, and this is probably uh, a mistake on my part to try to analyze anything that happens at the Oscars, but when you watch something like this year's Oscars, when Dune wins cinematography and score and all these individual technical awards and, and yet Dennis Villeneuve doesn't win director, it almost seems to me there's a disconnect there and all these things he would have been responsible for putting together and then he's not recognized for, not to take anything away from Jane Campion at all. Right. But it just seems to be that, that disconnect there, at least in my mind. Well, you know, the Academy breaks everything up to recognize the behind the scenes invisible people. And that's great, you know, but there often is a disconnect then, you know, between um, what the director does. I mean, that's probably the hardest thing to pinpoint. I mean, we have this image of this director, you know, running around the set with a megaphone yelling at everyone, or, you know, that's the old stereotypical. Um, but it is kind of hard to really decipher what is, what is down to the director when you're watching a scene and what is down to something else. And it's really, it's never one person, you know, but, uh, but there's a quote I came across, maybe this will express it better. There's a quote I came across, I wish I had come across when I was writing the book, because I would have put it in my introduction, but I just came across it a few weeks ago and was reading about Howard Hawks, um, and it was from uh, the writer of the book on Howard Hawks, uh, Joseph McBride, who's a film critic, 
And he said, let me see if I can get it right. If film is not a director's art, then it is not an art at all, merely a collaborative spectacle like vaudeville. Yeah, I mean, that makes a ton of sense because other, you know, the, the sum of the parts is what the director is responsible for. Otherwise, you've got these incongruent pieces. They're the glue. Yep. It's funny you, you mentioned the, the director running around uh, shouting at people. Whenever I think of a, a kind of a golden age director, I always think of, I think it's Douglas Fowley in uh, Singing in the Rain mm-hmm. with the jod purse and the big, and just losing his mind. <laughs> yes, me too. He's a yeah. great... Roll him. Right. And he's freaking out and, and, uh, and he, then he pulls the wire. Yeah. And she falls yeah. over. Yeah. I mean, when we think of great directors, we think uh, of those guys. Is I, I've been chewing through your book, and it's great timing because I just recently watched the Netflix documentary uh, Five Came Back about uh, you know John Huston, John Ford, uh, William Wyler, Capra, George Stevens. And these, like you mentioned, uh, a lot of their films are the ones that really have stood the test of time uh, as really memorable films across a lot of decades. Who do you think from the Golden Age has their their entire body of work has best stood that test of time? Um, maybe one of those guys I just mentioned. Yeah, well, everyone you mentioned, I would put on that list okay. of, of directors who had stood the test of time. I completely agree. George Stevens is one that comes to mind, Ann Weiler. And, you know, I also think of Fritz Lang, um, even though he was, he, man, what a career that man had. You know, he started in silence. I mean, a lot of these directors started in silence, but some started at the tail end of the silent era. But he really started, you know, I think 1919. Uh, and went on up to the, through the 60s, you know, just incredible. And I think Lang was ahead of his time, and he made films that were, they had a cynicism to them, you know, especially if you're talking about his film noirs. I was just watching recently While the City Sleeps from 1956 and thinking, I mean, it's dated, of course, but um, there's a certain, and maybe this was his background, you know, with the Nazis and having to, having to, uh, escape from Nazi Germany, which again, a lot of these directors did, you know, when you escape from that kind of evil, I think that you have a, a perspective on that, that evil might be lurking around every corner. And he, you know, you can really uh, express that in your films. And that's kind of what Lang did. And then there's also John Houston, I would like to add to that list, because Man, some of my favorite movies, and talk about cynical. I mean, The Maltese Falcon, <laughs> cynical but hopeful, you know, um, with like Key Largo is one of my favorites. Um, and uh, what else? I'm blanking on my other favorite, uh, John. Oh, Treasure of the Sierra Madre. I mean, these movies are, um, they're not just cynical. I mean, I use the word cynical, but they're not just like downbeat or negative for the sake of being cynical. There's a cynicism to them that I think. Um, is what makes them modern and fresh. But there's also, you know, heart and hope. Yeah, I just watched uh, Preetzi's Honor. Mm. I, think it was one, I think it was the second to the last uh, film that, that John Huston directed. Obviously, he got the Oscar for his daughter. Uh, and uh, I just finished reading the novel. And um, it's a fun mob story, but there's definitely a darkness to it. So it's, it's right up uh, Houston's alley. The, the great things about TCM books is that y- you guys have all these little sidebar bits of information and one of the things that really struck me um that you included was their active years how long in a lot of this, a lot of situations these guys were active guys and gals and then for some how quickly they were there and gone uh and john houston is one of those that he was around for quite a while and active for quite a while not only as a director but acting and you think of chinatown and, and others yeah yeah he's these these people and these i mean you know, of course, the women were amazing. I don't want to slight the women in any way, but let's face it, most of these, you know, directors were men in the day. And and I, you know, reading about these men, their lives, it was just dumbfounding because, you know, these men like fought in a world war and they raced cars and they risked their, you know, lives and they turned out like three or four great movies a year. And it was just like, wow, they work 16 hour days and they and they had fought in a war, and uh, they were a different breed. Smoked a lot of cigarettes. Yeah, they smoked a lot of cigarettes. They ate, <laughs> drank they ate a lot. Steaks, <laughs> and they drank like fish, and they all died of heart attacks at 50, between 50 and 60. So it was, it was a different world. Now, speaking of different, different worlds, one question I have 
for you is, is your opinion on something that seems to be more prevalent today, not that it didn't exist back in the golden age, you talk about John Houston, some of these other folks, but actors that turn director seems to be more common now than it used to be. I mean, you know, you look at George Clooney, Ron Howard, and his daughter, Bryce Dallas Howard. I mean, there seems to be a plethora of those. Is, is there something that's available to folks in filmmaking now that gives them the chance to do that? Or is it just something that is a maturation of the, of the process in Hollywood? Natural progression, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I've wondered that too. I feel like, you know, back in the studio system, directors were, they went up through the ranks. I mean, there was no directing school. Okay, back then there was no you couldn't go. I mean, there was no film school is what I meant to say. There's no film school and there was no like there more of a, hi a hierarchy that just it was a, they, they came up through the ranks. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm trying to say. I mean, these 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 directors, most of them. I mean, that's why someone like Ida Lupino or Dorothy Arjuna are so like exceptional is that most of them came up through the ranks. They started, you know, in one department. They started observing the filmmaking process from from on the sets, you know, in the studio system is what I'm saying. And they were kind of mentored. They found a mentor, they were groomed in some way. It's almost a very like mysterious, you know, secret society that you <laughs> somehow got into. And it was definitely not inclusive. We know that it was exclusive, but um, you know, it, it's, it's this process that they went through and then you were somehow handed a megaphone and made a director. And uh, it was um, not something that actors just I think it didn't even occur to most of them to do, you know, especially in the studio system when you're getting paid well to act and you're a movie star. It's like, why would I put myself under that kind of pressure and switch careers to suddenly get behind the camera and, you know, not get directors still didn't have the glory in those days uh, and they didn't have all the creative control. So, yeah, I think it was a lot of things that changed that suddenly, although, you know, D.W. Griffith started as an actor and he then he started directing in 1908. So, it always happened, but in the studio system, you're right. It, it wasn't, they were bred kind of differently. And then um, Ida Lupino really broke the ice. And then I, I'm sure you read in the book, there's a quote by Clint East, from Clint Eastwood that when he saw her directing, that gave him the idea that maybe an actor can direct. So, it, which wasn't in people's minds in those days. It's interesting you mentioned the studio system because even going back to Charlie Chaplin, right? He acted, yeah. directed, he did yeah. everything. But he was one of those guys along with, with uh, Douglas Fairbanks, were these more independent people and not locked into that studio system? Yes. No, it always happened. And there were, Chaplin was unique, but at the same time, he wasn't that unique in comedy because comedy was kind of its own little thing, its, its own little bubble in the silent days. You know, silent comedy was... Uh, was was fast and loose and fast and furious and uh there i mean uh, another example mabel norman she directed as well she was a female director in the early days of comedy it was more i think comedy was more like if you can be funny on camera it was more uh indie in the sense of like then make your own shorts you know get a can in, in silent days it was cheap there were there were more independence in the silent days because it was so much less expensive to make a movie uh, anybody could pretty much get a camera like today and shoot a movie, whether you could get it distributed widely is a different story, but, but it was, uh, there was a different atmosphere in comedy and it was kind of like anybody who can be funny, come in, you know, it, it open. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Chaplin and Hitchcock's name has come up, uh, Houston. Whose directing style would you say? And again, like you mentioned, things are really changing a lot uh, with the addition of CGI and things of that nature. Whose directing style do you see is most copied or do you hear is the most sought after? Whose name still comes up the most when maybe fledgling directors are trying to make their mark? Who do they look it has to? It to be Alfred Hitchcock. I yeah. mean, there's, you know, charting Hitchcock's influence on film and on our culture, I think would be impossible. It's incalculable. It's just, um, you know, we all see things through the lens of Alfred Hitchcock now, whether we are big Hitchcock fans or not. I think that's how we see things. You know, if you're, if the lights are out in, at night in your bedroom and you hear a noise, 
you know, and you get up and turn on the light, you almost see Hitchcock zooming in for, <laughs> you know, you feel that. It's just that our whole world is almost Hitchcockian, don't you I think? I thought that was just me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's everybody, I think. Well, it's certainly me. Maybe it's just you and me. <laughs> now, you, you do have a book coming out, I, I understand, a project you're currently working on. It's Psycho 60. Now, is that the 60th anniversary of Psycho? The film? Yes, which okay. has passed. Tell us about that. <laughs> but um, yeah, that that's something that I got a chance to edit. Um, okay. And uh, so yeah, it's not it's not a book as a writer, but I did contribute a lot a lot to the editorial process and bringing it all together. Sort of like a director. Hmm. Ooh. No. <laughs> nice tie-in. Nice tie-in. Yeah. So that's going to be really cool. It's it's going to be one of these big luxury books that uh you know i probably can't afford but <laughs> somebody will enjoy it well um uh, going back to we were talking about women in, in directing and i mentioned jane champion earlier um until this year in the entire 94 year history of the oscars only two women previously have won uh best directors award catherine bigelow and chloe Zhao. now jane champion makes the third you feature four groundbreaking women in your book dorothy um, Arsner, Lois Weber, Ida Lupino, and Elaine May. Uh, what do we owe to those trailblazers? Obviously, they were trailblazers, kind of breaking that glass ceiling of, of women directors. And how would the film industry be different without their contributions? I think the film industry would be surprisingly different without the contributions of women, not just the four in the book. You know, they were chosen because they were the most prolific and the most high profile. But there were so many other, as I mentioned, you know, director, women directors in the early days. We don't even have a complete list. I mean, that's how far back it went um, because many of those films are lost and they just don't exist anymore. And even the credits for them are lost. So I have to give a quick plug to um, the AFI. They have a project, uh, Women They Talk About. And they're, they're actually going through as many old records as they can, trying to find, you know, women, uh, not just directors, but women contributors uh, behind the scenes that, whose names have been lost to the sands of time. So that's an admirable project. But yeah, to answer your question, you know, again, like I mentioned, Mabel Normand, Frances Marion was, she only directed two films for Mary Pickford, but she was the most the highest paid, most prolific, most famous screenwriter for years in the late silent and then the early talky era. And there were so many others. And women really, sh gave, they, they gave the industry, you know, a woman's perspective. And then the thing is, is that once that woman's perspective was put on film and a woman's viewpoint was put on film, then men could come along and say, oh, okay, you know, I'm going to kind of mimic that. I'm going to try to get, get into a, get, make this film for, from a woman's perspective. And I'm not diminishing that as a bad thing. It's a good thing, you know, because, but it started with the women with like Lois Weber and, you know, these early directors giving you the female perspective. Then because directors were mostly men, the men could, could come along. And there are some great films from a woman's point of view made by men, you know, then that that's, um, that's a legitimate thing. I mean, there should always be more, you know, I always think that there should be more women directors, but, um, but even with the few that there were, the women made a big impact on how, on how the industry made films and, and um, considers women in the films. It is interesting when you look at the women who were able to break through and, and not just the ones that you mentioned, but uh, Polly Platt from a production designer perspective. Jennifer Lee, who was the first female director of Disney animated film when she directed Frozen and how big that was, which led to um, kind of this uh, changing, changing of the guard within, within Disney too, because now she is the chief creative officer. I believe that's her title, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's amazing that when they, they were a, have been able to break through, they really make a mark. So, I mean, let's hope that that continues and we get more and more of them because it's uh, definitely a, a, a fresh viewpoint that I think is really relevant. Yeah, same here. I'm, I'm hoping for, uh, for that trend to continue. I mean, just to, just to even the scales, you know, I mean, it's just been, it was like, a, you know, 99% men for so long. You're obviously, that's just so out of balance, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a $64,000 question. If you, Sloane DeForest, could spend a day on the set with any director, past or present, 
Who would it be? And what film? And what would you be most interested in learning from them? Well, I'm quite sure that I should give a politically correct answer to that, but I'm not going to. I'm going to be <laughs> honest and say <laughs> that, um, quite frankly, it would be Roman Polanski, and the uh -huh. film would be either Rosemary's Baby or Chinatown, uh -huh. um, because I saw Rosemary's Baby on TV when I was probably 11 or 12. I've been in love with that film ever since. I've read the novel several times too. And I'm just, I marvel at Polanski's ability to capture that book on film. And he had this ability to, in Chinatown as well to capture the feeling of sinister undercurrents mm -hmm. on film. How do you do that? I mean, sure, you can do it with music. You could do it with lighting. But he did it in a scene like, for example, where Mia Farrow and John Cassavetes are sitting at their dining room table and sunlight is flooding in and it's in the morning and she's in a bathrobe and there's no music and there's no sound and there's no shadows and there's no anything and yet you sense this these undercurrents of something horrible is going on beneath the surface how did he do that it, it blows my mind um that's what i would that's what i would like to see the process to be the fly on the wall and and you know really witness how that was crafted and put on film yeah, Chinatown is one of those, as far as I'm concerned, perfect films. Uh, and again, it, it's what makes it magic. Uh, Polanski, Robert Town adding to the screenplay, John Huston, Jack Nicholson, a, somewhere in the middle there. And again, yeah, those sinister undercurrents, pun intended, considering it's about water rights. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but uh, for me, I've got to go with Billy Wilder, um, just mm -hmm. because it would get me in the same room with Jack Lemmon. And Marilyn Monroe, um, another guy who came from Europe and kind of a dark past and took that darkness and turned it into a lighthearted darkness, I guess. Uh, yes. You know, with things like I'm the so apartments. glad you brought up Billy Wilder. Yeah. Yes, we can't, we shouldn't go through this podcast without mentioning him. He's one of my all time favorites, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Greg, how about you? I'll go one step further and I will say Mel Brooks, and I'm going to do a Billy Wilder tie in because Billy Wilder complimented. complimented Mel Brooks and the fact that he was the only director he knew who could stage a Western and a musical in one scene. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, I would, you're right. I would love to be involved in those conversations when he knows he's almost crossing the line mm -hmm. and he doesn't, or he does just enough or because it's, it's, per it's a perfect balance that he's always had in his... Uh... You're right, you're right. Mel Brooks would be amazing to witness on Young Frankenstein or Blazing Saddles. Uh, Young Frankenstein's one of my favorites, so... Um, Ours too, yeah. Yeah, because he really pushed that envelope, but managed to do it so charmingly. Mm -hmm. Another person I think we should, it bears mentioning on, on this show, specifically because it's a stage and screen podcast, is uh, Elia Kazan. Yes. Uh, and his ability to take the works of Tennessee Williams and others and go from stage to screen and not miss a beat. Completely agree. Because, uh, I mean, you know, I, people think I'm being, you know, uh, socially acceptable by saying, oh, it's hard to pick a favorite. I love all these directors. But it's true. I mean, uh, there's so many great ones. Kazan is another one that you just marvel at because, like you said, stage and screen, and yet his films. They don't feel stage bound. I mean, maybe a couple of them, the early ones do, but you know, he, wow, he's underrated. Yeah, it, it takes something. There's so many bombs that you take from stage to screen and to do it well is, is unique. Vincent Minnelli too, he started, I mean, he started on stage as well. And I mean, the things he was able to do on film, he's another one that's underrated. Well, speaking of directors and filmmaking in general the tcm film festival is coming up april 21st through 24th will you be involved in that at all slow yes i will i can announce it here it's just confirmed last week i'm going to be introducing mervyn Leroy's waterloo bridge with vivian lee and robert taylor from 1940 on uh, at the festival on sunday morning oh congratulations good news yeah Thank you. i'm excited to get to do that great film I love the festival. I'm so, oh my God, I can't tell you how happy I am that they're back. I've missed them for two years. <laughs> Are you guys going to get to make it down at all to the festival? Uh, we, we would love to, uh, but unfortunately, we also have day jobs. Yeah. Uh, this is a labor of love, uh, really born out of quarantine. 
But it's put us in touch with a lot of great people. Uh, spoke with Scott McGee last week. Uh, it's mm-hmm. one of a, a friend of ours, uh, Jeremy Arnold. Yes. We're gonna be trying to check in with Jeremy. Uh, do a do a video uh, feed with him from from the festival. So we'll be checking in uh, in spirit for sure. Oh, great. Okay, yeah. that sounds good. Yeah, it's. I I think it's gonna be a good one. And and, and what else is uh, up next for you? What's on What's on the horizon for you? Uh, any more book projects? You said the uh, the Psycho Sixty has has kind of wrapped. Uh, anything else uh, coming up? You know, uh, I don't have an answer for that right now because I've got a few different irons in the fire and I'm uh, not sure which one is going to be the next big project. So, but if I would update my website more more frequently, <laughs> then people could keep track of all the stuff on my website. That's kind of the idea. But um, SloanDeForest.com, incidentally, everybody. Yes, yeah, SloanDeForest.com. I will try to update more often and then you can keep abreast of all of my projects. Perfect. And we'll, we'll link your site in the show notes, obviously, uh, and uh, where you can also find the books, Amazon.com, of course. Uh, we've been enjoying this one and uh, would love to uh, stay in touch and hear about what's coming up. It's been very, very educational and, uh, again, just like the book, entertaining at the same time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Matt and Greg. It was great to be on. Well, thank you again to our guest, Sloane DeForest, her new book from TCM and Running Press, The Essential Directors, The Art and Impact of Cinema's Most Influential Filmmakers, is available on Amazon and on her website, sloanedeforest.com, and of course, linked in our show notes. If you enjoyed episode 60, please make sure and follow us and share the podcast with a friend. Tell them to check out our new website at myelmanandhaver.com, and tune in on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Audible, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. And keep up with all our latest on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and check out special segments like Get to Know a Theater in the Mix and special artist interviews on YouTube. As always, thanks for supporting local theater and for joining us on Heilman and Haver. 